just before I introduce Jeff, uh, by a show of hands, how many of you were actually at this, the prophetic seminar last Saturday? Just raise your hands. Cool. How many of you um, received a prophetic word from Jeff? Put your hands up. Oh, quite a few of you. All right. Put your hands up again if you would say that that word was like maybe 75% or more super accurate. Okay. All right. Hold on. Keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. Keep your hands up if you would say it was like 90% or more super accurate. Okay. How about 95? Pretty cool. Okay. I just, I, I just wanted to point that out because um, it was such a blessing. It was so awesome, that prophetic seminar. And I know a lot of the prophetic and these types of things are, are mystical and they seem kind of weird, but I just wanted you to see maybe just from a show of hands how, like, I don't know, I mean, just hearing a word from God, like hearing, hearing the heart of God to you and having, having someone else who doesn't know you speak into your life and is like, this is how God sees you. And you're like, oh my gosh, like that confirms everything, you know, about me as a person. And like, it stirs something up on the inside of you. And so that's, that's something amazing I want to share with you about Pastor Jeff is when he, when he speaks and when he shares I'm not trying to make him sound like a wizard or anything, but I'm just saying, I really want you to listen to him and just hear the voice of God. Just, and like what um, was shared earlier today, just how do you respond, you know? Let's listen to the heart of God. Let's listen to the heart of the Father. And, and I, as people, we're imperfect, and so, you know, it's not that every single word we're exactly perfect, but I do want to encourage you that a lot of people receive really, really solid words um, from Jeff, and so I, I really re respect and honor what Jeff has to say and how he communicates the prophetic and how he communicates the heart of God. It's just really cool. So I do want to introduce him a little bit here. Um, oh, yeah. He is the author of the book Prophetic Like Jesus, and I do have a little book counter over here. I really encourage you, if you've not read his book yet or if you don't have a copy, we have them here for sale on special and all that. But please, please consider buying one or at least come, come skip through it and look at it. Um, it's a really, really powerful book. Our ministry team has gone through it, and um, several of us are also going through it again. Um, it's just an amazing book on demystifying the prophetic and hearing God's voice for other people. Um, there's also another book over there uh, about hearing God's voice, and I agree with almost everything that that author says. So some of you know that it was me. Anyway, um, so Pastor Jeff has, uh, in the past, he has served on the leadership team of, uh, you may have heard of IHOP, International House of Prayer in Kansas City. He served there for many years. Uh, he worked in their PhD department, which is their prophecy, healing, and deliverance department. He also uh, taught at their Bible school and uh, has been around the world uh, teaching and preaching the Word of God and especially the heart of the Father through prophetic ministry. Um, he's pastored three churches and uh, he's planted one church, but all that stuff is really great. But he always asks me, he says, would you just introduce me as someone who wants to be a friend of God? <laughs> and just wants to serve his people. So that is the heart of our friend Jeff. So I do want to introduce Jeff. Come on up. Let's give him a warm welcome, please. Well, thank you. Thanks for that introduction. And uh, I have, uh, I, when it comes to the prophetic, you know, Pastor Josh said, however you say it, uh, in the Midwest, it's usually prophetic, and uh, in California, it's prophetic. So it doesn't really matter how you say it, but I have never actually had um, somebody do what Josh just did to measure my accountability. <laughs> I believe people in the prophetic should be accountable, and if I give somebody a word that's not accurate, I want to know about it. But the way he did it just now, I've never seen that done before. So I just wonder what he would have done if nobody raised their hand. <laughs> And then he introduced me as a prophetic person to come up and speak. I would have been like, uh, let's go. <laughs> anyway, for me, the heart of the prophetic is really, is just learning to love people, learning to see people like Jesus sees them. Um, I got to be honest with you, I never have really liked the title of the book, Prophetic Like Jesus. It was not my idea. Uh, I was going to title the book, uh, The Prophetic Servant because my perspective of the prophetic is that it's a gift given to serve the body, not to build a ministry or, or build up a particular person or create any kind of celebrity status among prophetic people. But Destiny Image said that they thought there would be too much uh, misunderstanding about the word servant in the title, so they wanted to change the title. But my per uh, perspective of the prophetic has always been about seeing people the way Jesus sees them and seeing the gift of prophecy and the office of prophet 
uh, as uh, uh, places to serve, places to give, places to love. So anyway, I'll just let you know that about me going in. Um, I have a really simple message this morning. Uh, so I'm going to pray and just get started. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence here. We thank you for your goodness, your kindness. We thank you, Lord, that you see us, that you see this community, that you see the Central Coast, and that you love this people, this community, and the Central Coast. We ask today, Abba, that um, you would just uh, manifest that love in us and put a burning passion and a burning fire in our hearts to see like you see, to hear like you hear, to love like you love. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I just uh, want to talk today about becoming a church that sees. And by that I mean a church that sees people, a church that sees what God is doing and jumps in uh, to do that with him. Um, and I'm going to start with a really uh, familiar verse, John uh, 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he, gave me, that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Everybody knows this verse. What does it mean that God so loved the world? Because that's the beginning of it. That's where we begin to come into contact with what God sees, what God thinks, how God feels. One thing it doesn't mean is that he loves the world's systems. And anywhere that Jesus saw oppression, he spoke up against it. By Jesus' very life, by the way he lived, by what he taught, by how he interacted with individuals, it was clear and obvious that he did not come to strengthen world systems. He did not come to strengthen world religions or the Jewish religion as it was. He did not come to strengthen political systems or economic systems. What he did is he came to see people and love people and change people's lives. And that's how he lived his life, by, by the very ways he taught, by the ways he interacted with people. It was very clear that he did not come to fix the current state of affairs. He did not come to introduce some kind of uh, a new way of governing or a new economic system or anything like that. He came to do something completely different. He came to do something brand new. That's why the center of his teaching always centered around the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven is like this, Jesus would say. The kingdom of heaven is like that, Jesus would say. And then he would do something personally that would bring transformation to people to see what kingdom heaven, kingdom love, and kingdom power looks like. When it says God so loved the world, He's talking about the people in the world. He's talking about those who have been wounded, those who have been uh, invisible, those who uh, have been uh, uh, stepped on and, and, and brought down. And what he did is he came to bring a brand new kingdom to shift that. And it was very clear in his pronouncement in Luke 4 when he, quotes, when he quoted Isaiah 61. When he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom to the captives and release from darkness the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, the day of the vintage of our God, to comfort those who mourn, to provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of despair. Again, he didn't come to fix an old system. He came to introduce something new. He came to introduce the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, where the perspective was a heavenly perspective and where people were seen as being made in the image of God. Basically what Jesus did, and even in, in speaking, uh, what he was speaking here, he was saying, I, I have come to reopen, to re-see, to open up the doors to, to see the image of God in that which I have created. When it says God so loved the world, God created the world. And when God created the world, he created you and I in his image. And everything, that oppression, that sin, that shame, that brokenness, all of those things that crushed people, that held people down, they covered up and injured and shamed the image of God in people. 
When God created us in his image, he created us uh, with dignity. He created us with worth. He created us with value. And every system and every sin and every oppressive thing did more and more and more to injure that image, to cover that image. So that when we would see ourselves, we would see shame. When we would see ourselves, we would see our woundedness, our brokenness. And then that would transfer into how we would see other people. And we would measure other people and their value by world systems instead of by a kingdom system. By wealth or glory or fame or influence or whatever. Those are the, the standards and the norms that society judges people by. How wealthy are you? How influential are you? You know, this word influencer, which has become so popular. Uh, people on TikTok who have millions of views just because they dress a certain way and, and talk about different things, and we call them influencers. You know, that's kind of how the world has, has set things up. Uh, what do you do? And, and if you're a janitor, then maybe you don't do so much. But if you're the president of a company, then you do a lot. We have set value on people according to worldly standards, and that is a, a, a misinterpretation and a misunderstanding of the image of God. Because God doesn't place value on people by what they do. He doesn't place value on people by what they've done, by their past, by their brokenness, by their woundedness, by their success, or by their failure. If God based his love and his kindness to us on our success and our failure, I mean, you know, our lives would be like this. You know? I feel successful today. I did something well. God really likes me. And then tomorrow I blow it. Well, God's only mad at me. God does not base it that way. And when it says God so loved the world, it means that he came, Jesus came, seeing the image of God and who he created, and he came to bring restoration and wholeness and life and fullness out of that image so that we could be redeemed, so that we could look like our Heavenly Father, so that we could see like He sees. I promise not to have notes problems today. <laughs> For those of you who were at the seminar, I got lost in my notes, and anyway. The Gospels are a revelation of how Jesus did this. And basically, the two things that Jesus constantly did in his teaching and his action was lead people to worship and lead people to good works. Everything that Jesus did was centered around those two things. Now, when we think of worship, we think of, you know, those mornings where uh, we have a few recordings in Scripture. Jesus, get up early, go out, you know, to the wilderness or the mountain and spend time with God. And we say, you know, that was Jesus' worship. But Jesus worshipped in another way, and, and I'm going to talk about it in a second in a conversation he had with a woman. But he said, the Father's looking for those to worship in spirit and truth. And another way Jesus worshipped was in truth. And by that, I mean by choice. There were many times in Jesus' life where the choice he made was a choice based in worship, the acknowledgement of the worthiness and the glory of his Father. For example, in the wilderness when Satan tempted him, and said, if you'll just worship me, you can have all these world systems and you can control everything. And he made a choice. And in the choice that he made, worship the Lord and him only, that was worship. Sometimes worship is more than just saying, I love you, Jesus. It's, it's in those moments where we're confronted with what is true and we choose what is true. And in choosing what is true, that's actually worship. So we see that often with Jesus, and then out of that worship comes doing well, doing good. And over and over again, we see Jesus restoring the image of God in people, removing shame, touching, healing, encouraging, strengthening through his words. So it's upward and it's outward, and that was what Jesus did continually. So the mission of the church is to continue that tradition. I like you know, what you share, Josh, about your mission here. The mission of the church is to see people, and in seeing people, to see them like God sees them. And in seeing them like God sees them, to restore value, to recognize the image of God in them, and to speak life and encouragement and bring them into the kingdom of heaven, set them free from old systems, from shame, from sin, from the things that bound them, and to bring them into life. And the way we do that is just simply through the kindness of Jesus through loving people the way Jesus loves people, through seeing people 
the way Jesus sees them and then treating them the way Jesus would treat them. We live in a pretty toxic society. Kindness is hard to find. The church should be a beacon of kindness in these days. The church should be a light of kindness in these days. The church should be bringing culture of the kingdom as opposed to all the toxicity that's going on. So along these lines, I just want to share two stories from the scripture today. The first is from John chapter 4, verses 4 through 26. I'm not going to read them all. I'm just going to tell the story. And you're familiar with it. So the scripture says Jesus had to go to Samaria. Now, we don't really know why Jesus had to go to Samaria. Because if you read the front end and the back end, he really didn't go through Samaria to do anything. But at the end of the day, there's a revival in Samaria, and that's really why Jesus had to go. But it starts in this very simple way. So it's a hot day. He's been walking, traveling with the disciples. The road's dusty, it's dirty. He comes to Jacob's well, and he sits down to rest. And as he's sitting down to rest around noon, a woman comes to the well to draw water. And Jesus asks her for a drink. And her response is, how is it that you, a Jew, ask me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink? Jesus says, if you knew who was asking you, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Now, she's totally into the physical sight of things, physical ability of things, so she's looking at Jesus and she's observing, well, how can you get this? You don't have anything to draw with and this well is deep. And Jesus responds to her with the water that I give, bubbles up on the inside and it brings you eternal life and eternal joy. And now she's coming around. Well, then can you give me some of this water? Instead of like jumping right in, like if we were evangelizing, this would have been our point. Yeah. Okay, jump in right here. They're asking. Instead, Jesus, because he knows her story, and this is what's cool about this, he knows her story even before he's talking to her. But he lets her tell it. He draws it out of her. So he says, okay, um, bring your husband. Well, I'm not married. I don't have a husband. And Jesus says, right, I know you're not married. You've had five husbands, actually. And the man you're living with now is not your husband. She shifts into religious mode. I perceive you're a prophet. <laughs> so I've had this religious question in my mind for a while because the Samaritans say, you know, we should worship on the mountain, but the Jews say worship in Jerusalem. So she's shifting from her inner pain. She's shifting from the things that she's ashamed of that she really doesn't want to expose, and she's moving them into a religious realm. And Jesus opens it up pretty much and says, you know, salvation comes from the Jews and you don't really know what you worship, but a day is coming and now is when the, the Father is looking for those who will worship him in spirit and truth. And then she begins to open up. And she recognizes something special and she says, well, when the Messiah comes, he'll tell us all things. And Jesus says, you're talking to him. I mean, just imagine that moment. You're talking to him. Her mind is blown. She doesn't know what to do. She just runs into town telling everybody, hey, come see this guy. Come see this guy, which is really what should happen when we get new life. Hey, come and see this guy. And then the whole town comes out, and then Jesus stays for three or four days, and he keeps teaching, and there's transformation and revival. Now, the thing about the story that I want to bring out mostly is that Jesus sees something in this woman. He sees something in her that attracts his attention. I mean, just the first line of the story, that there's so much um, going on. And if you don't understand, it's easy to miss the racial and the religious and the gender and the political tension in this moment. Jesus says, give me a drink of water. And her first response is, how is it that you, a Jew, Ask me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink. So right away, first there's the gender issue. Because a good Jewish man would not give a Samaritan woman the time of day. Because there was this 
one thing about the Jewish men and their traditions and their culture, but there was another thing which was also the religious issue. A Samaritan woman. Now you have to go all the way back to the end of King Solomon's reign to get this. Because when King Solomon died, his son Rehoboam inherited the throne. There was a lot of tension among what you would call the workers or the laborers in society. And so Jeroboam comes to Rehoboam and says, hey, look, your father imposed a heavy labor burden on us. Now we'll serve you if you'll lessen that burden. And Rehoboam goes to the elders and the elders say, yeah, do it. That's, that would be wise. Do that. And then he goes to his contemporaries, all the young dudes, and they're going, what, man, no. Don't give in to those guys. Tell them you're going to make it harder, which basically is what he does. And when he does that, Jeroboam takes ten of the tribes, rebels against the last two tribes, which is Judah and Benjamin, and he starts another kingdom in Samaria. Now, the problem he has is the Jewish feasts require all the people to go to, to Jerusalem to worship. And so he's afraid that when they go to Jerusalem to worship, they'll be won back to Rehoboam and they'll leave him. And so what he does is he makes his own religion and builds an altar in Samaria. And so there's a whole new religion that comes out of this. So when this woman says, why would you, a, a Jew, talk to me, first a woman, and second, a Samaritan? In other words, the religious tension that's there is another reason why Jesus wouldn't talk to her or see her. So right away, there's a gender issue, there's a religious issue, there's a cultural issue, and then there were political divides between them. And when you read through the Old Testament, uh, the differences between the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah, all the fighting that took place in between, all the uh, uh, idolatry that took place, there was also this great political tension. And this woman just can't figure it out. Why would you talk to me? I mean, look at all these things. Look at the religious differences. Look at the political toxicity. Look at the religious toxicity. Does that sound a little familiar? But Jesus does this because he sees her. She's got all these reasons why he shouldn't see her. She is surprised that he's taken time. She is surprised that he's sitting down with her. She is surprised that he is listening to her story. And as he listens to her story, he just keeps loving her. He just keeps pulling her in. He just keeps not judging her, not putting in her in a box, not defining her by her failure. Why does she have five husbands? It's very likely she had five hundreds of five husbands because she had to marry five brothers. Because in the Old Testament, the requirement was if a, a husband married a woman and he died without producing a child, then she had to marry his brother and on and on and on so that they could keep that particular line alive. So for whatever reason, she's been unable to bear a child. She's possibly gone through five husbands. She's given up and now she's living with someone. Jesus doesn't jump in and go, oh, you adulteress. What's wrong with you? He sees all the shame, all the heartbreak, you know, of not being able to bear that child. She sees all the shame. Why is this woman at the well at noon when normally the women come to the well in the morning? Because by coming at noon, she avoids all the stereotyping, all the gossip that the other women say about her and her lifestyle and all of these various things and the curses that have been put on her. Here she is, broken, wounded, Feeling invisible, feeling unseen, the image of God in her, feeling disappointed. And Jesus just sees past all of that stuff to the image of God in her to speak life, to speak hope, to remove shame, to remove brokenness. And mostly all he does is listen. And then he interjects life. And then at the end of the conversation, he reveals himself as who he is. And she is awakened, alive, born again, we might call it. And then she wants to tell everybody. Her life is transformed because she was seen. 
We need to be a church that sees. Not the stereotypes, not the judges, not that puts people in boxes, but a people who sees beyond that. Toxicity in culture causes us to stereotype people, and when we stereotype people, we dehumanize them. And when we dehumanize them, then we have the freedom to criticize them and judge them and say things about them because actually we're not seeing a person anymore. We're seeing a stereotype. We're seeing something else beyond that. And Jesus calls us to see people, to see the image of God in people. Second story I want to tell you, very similar. I mentioned this uh, last Saturday during the prophetic seminar, but uh, this is a story where Jesus is at the home of, of Simon the Pharisee. Now, whenever the Pharisees invited Jesus to dinner, it wasn't because they wanted to get saved. <laughs> They had lots and lots and lots and lots of questions for Jesus, arguments for Jesus. Very often they wanted to trip him up. Um, they knew all the stories. They couldn't figure him out. You know, they, they wanted to get, basically, they wanted to get Jesus on their side. And Jesus wouldn't get on their side. So Simon invites Jesus to this dinner. And from the very beginning of the dinner, we're told that this woman, and we don't know if she was there or she followed Jesus in, we don't know how she got into this party, but she got into the party. And from the very moment she got in, she's weeping on Jesus' feet. And she's wiping his feet with her hair, and she has brought some oil in, and she's anointing his feet with oil. And we don't know how long this, this goes, except that she was there as soon as Jesus came in. So maybe 10 minutes, maybe 20 minutes, maybe an hour, we don't really know. Uh, but it's very obvious that this woman is just weeping on Jesus' feet. And, and, you know, this isn't probably a quiet thing. She's probably not just going, <laughs> it's, this is probably more like, ah, Jesus, Jesus. I mean, there's probably snot, you know, there's all kinds of stuff going on. Now imagine that for an hour. Imagine, Josh, you're teaching on a Sunday morning and a woman comes up and the whole time you're preaching, she's just weeping at your feet and she's crying. And, you know, Jesus could have put a stop to this at any point, but he doesn't. He just lets it go. And as he's letting it go, you can feel these Pharisees are like, it's this tension is building up in them like, that's enough. Enough already. All right, that's enough. Now, we're also told in the story that the woman had a reputation, that she was known as a sinner. So most likely she was probably a prostitute. And here she is. And their religious rules say that if you're a holy person, you don't let an unclean, which would prostitute would fall into that category. If you were sick, that would fall into that category. If you broke the law in some way, it would fall into that category. But the Pharisees would not let an unclean person touch them because then they would be ceremonially unclean and then there was a whole process they had to go through of washings to get clean again. So here's this woman whom they're saying is unclean. She's already classified. She's already put in a category. She's already being seen as, as someone that doesn't fit in this setting. And you can feel their tension. Why doesn't he say something? Why does he say, why is he letting this happen? Why is he doing this? He can't be a prophet because if he was a prophet, he would know she's unclean. And if he knew that, he wouldn't let her touch him. And Jesus lets it go the whole time. And finally, he addresses it. And he tells the story. Simon, I'm going to tell you a story. There was these two guys and they both owed their master insurmountable amounts of money. One owed, I'm just making this up, one owed $10 million and one owed $10,000. They both came and they begged the master, please, please forgive us our debt. Please forgive us our debt. And the master out of his kindness forgave both of them. Now, Simon, which one do you think would love the master the most? And Simon says, well, obviously the one who had the larger debt. And then Jesus says to him, 
Do you see this woman? Keyword, see. Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet. And yet she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss. And by the way, all these things that Jesus is saying Simon didn't do, these were cultural in Israel. These were cultural for their community. You automatically gave water for somebody to wash their feet. You automatically gave them a kiss of hospitality. This was just normal life. Jesus is saying, you didn't do these things for me, but she did. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. For as her love is greatly shown, but whoever is forgiven little, loves little. So just three things I want to say about this. First, the way Simon saw the woman and the way Jesus saw the woman. Simon did not see the heart of the woman. Simon's legalistic, judgmental lenses put her in a category as soon as she walked in. She's a sinner. She's unclean. She has no place here. There's no place for her to fit in our community. She's an outsider. She needs to go. And that would have been the attitude of everybody. But Jesus sees something different. Jesus sees the image of God in this woman. Jesus sees her as a creation of her father. Jesus sees in her the love and the beauty and the potential and the grace and all the things that God had in mind when he created her. Jesus sees her. Simon doesn't. Simon is stuck in religious judgmentalism. The second thing is what it meant for this woman to be seen. Hers was an extraordinary act of worship, but it was also a very risky act. Jesus could have shut her down. She could have been stopped from even entering. For her to take this risk required great love. I mean, she just, we don't know where she heard about Jesus. We don't know what she saw Jesus do. We don't know what it was between her and Jesus that she saw that made her want to be there that day. But when she saw Jesus, she saw somebody who would love her, who could restore her, who could change her life, who could give her hope again. She had been living without hope for who knows how long. And now she sees an opportunity to get hope and an opportunity to, to be transformed. And so nothing's going to stop her. And Jesus doesn't shut her down. He sees her heart. He sees her willingness. He sees the risk that she's taking. And he doesn't stop her. He actually receives her worship. And then the third thing is just the way that Jesus fights for people. When I look back, I mean, I've been doing this in ministry for over 50 years. I got saved in the Jesus movement. I had a radical encounter with Jesus one night, just me and him. There was a, a couple of other guys there that weren't saved. It was just... It was just the grace and the mercy of God just coming and finding me when I wasn't looking for him and revealing himself to me. When I look back at that and my history in Jesus over 50 years, one of the things that I know is that Jesus has fought for me. One of the things I know is that in my lowest moments, even as a believer, and in my broken places, even as a believer, that Jesus saw me and he fought for me. And he sees you and he fights for you. He fights for you. Psalm 57 says that you collect all my tears in your bottle. You have seen my journey, and you will turn my enemy away from me. He sees us just like he saw this woman. 
Everybody else put her in a category. Everybody else said she is this and nothing more than this, and she'll never be anything more than this, and this is all she can expect for the rest of her life. But when she saw Jesus, she saw the possibility of something new. When she saw Jesus, she saw the possibility of a transition in her life. She saw a possibility of hope, a possibility of change, a possibility of love, and she had to take the chance. And so she breaks in and she weeps at his feet, and he sees her the whole time. And he receives her love. And in receiving her love, he pronounces her forgiven. Now, it's very interesting because he says, he who loves much is forgiven much, but he who loves little is forgiven little. And I never thought about that second part of this till I was looking at this again. How, how can you be forgiven little? I mean, God has a infinite river and fountain of mercy and grace and forgiveness and kindness and love. So if you are forgiven little, it's not from God's end. If we're forgiven little, it's because we've either asked little or we've not recognized the condition that we're in. And we've kind of maybe had a little pride or self-righteousness there. I used to be involved in an evangelism program years ago when we were on staff at a church in the Rio Grande uh, evangelism explosion. And I remember the pastor telling a story about a guy in the congregation who really wasn't saved, but he was a very successful businessman. And when the pastor confronted him and, and, and announced to him, you know, uh, Jesus came to forgive your sins and, and to transform you. And, and the guy's response was, well, you know, I'm not that big of a sinner. I'm really a pretty good guy. And the pastor's response is, well, he came to make you better. And then the guy got saved. And I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> It doesn't really work that way. Jesus didn't come to make us better. He didn't come to fix us. He came to kill us and then raise us to life. If we're forgiven little, it means that we haven't actually come to terms with how much we've been forgiven. And pride could be an issue in that. Maybe we think we're really better than somebody else and, and we don't need to be forgiven so much. You know, my, my father, uh, I led him to the Lord about six days before he died. But his biggest argument against the gospel was, uh, was uh, about sin. Well, I've been a good guy. I've lived a good life. I've done good things. I've been generous. And I, I won't ever forget the look on his face when I said, Well, Dad, have you ever told a lie? And he was outraged. Well, of course, everybody lies. And I said, Well, then you're a sinner. Well, yeah, but I've done good things. We can do 99 good things and one bad thing and we're still a sinner. And the results of sin, the wages of sin is death. And when we understand that and we understand the desperation of our life, then we ask for a lot of forgiveness. I mean, I'm going to be like that, that, that river of forgiveness. I'm not going to be going, I, I just need a little. I'm going to be at that river going, no, wash over me, wash over. And in fact, just dump me, you know baptize me and keep me under till I really am dead and then raise me back up. We as a church, if we're going to see, we have to be free of self-righteousness. We have to be free of looking at the world because when we understand the depths of our forgiveness, how can we not want to see that for our neighbor? How can we not want to see that for our community? How can we not want to see that for our families? Being a church that sees means that we learn to see the way Jesus sees. We learn to love the way Jesus loves. How many people in your community here, even in your church, how many people do you think feel unseen today? How many people are in a crowd? Maybe they're popular. Maybe they've accomplished wonderful things. Maybe they're good, maybe they're bad. But how many people do you think feel unseen, feel absolutely invisible? Nobody knows, nobody cares, nobody sees, nobody understands, and nobody wants to. Because Jesus is the answer for that. Jesus sees. Jesus sees them, and a seeing church sees them, and assigns value, not because of what they can bring or what they have to offer, but because they're created in the image of God. And because they're created in God's image, there's value, there's worth. There's something there to be loved, something there to be seen. 
David understood this. Psalm 31, 7 and 8, he said, I will exalt and rejoice in your steadfast love because you have seen my affliction. You've taken notice of my adversities and have not delivered me into the hand of the enemy. And you have set my feet in a broad place. David understood, even in his weakness, even in his brokenness, he understood what it was to be seen by God what it was to know that God was paying attention and taking note of everything that was happening to him and that God was acting on his behalf to set him in a spacious place. His response was, you have seen, you've taken notice, and you've given me breathing room. How many people just need room to breathe today in your community, in your church, in your family? How many people just need to be able to go, with some hope, with some joy, with some life, knowing that somebody hears, sees, and cares. God wants a church that sees. And we've focused so long on having good worship and having good gifts and so many things where we just haven't seen people. I have probably, I don't know, maybe 14 years of, of a senior pastoral experience besides my time at IHOP and doing just so many other things. And when I look at the church today, sometimes my heart just breaks. Lord, we can't do church for the sake of church. If all we're doing is just trying to keep the wheels moving for church and keep church going for the sake of church itself, then we're missing something. But to do church in a community, to do church as a community, to see the way Jesus sees, to love the way Jesus loves, even if it means you never become a mega church with, you know, $20,000 a week to spend on worship and equipment and studios and all of that, even if it means you never become any bigger than you are, but you just keep loving people and people come through and get loved and get transformed and get changed because they're seen, because they're loved. But that's the gospel. I don't have anything against a mega church that's preaching the gospel and doing the work of Christ. I don't have anything against that. But when we lose touch with our community, when we lose touch with the people around us, when we stop seeing people like Jesus sees them and start categorizing and dehumanizing and putting people in boxes, then we've lost touch with the gospel. And to be a church that sees doesn't mean you have to preach loudly to any and everybody you encounter. When Jesus talked about the sheep and the goats, he didn't say he was preaching the gospel. He just said, did you clothe the naked? Did you feed the poor? Did you visit the prisoner? Because if you did, you did this to me. I'm just saying sometimes our good work should go before we open our mouths. Acts of kindness, acts of love, before we pounce, you know, with the four spiritual laws. So I'm just gonna pray for you today. So Jesus, I just thank you for this opportunity. I thank you, Lord, for this precious, precious block. Thank you, Jesus, for these who are here this morning, outside, in the parking lot, singing your praise, declaring your love. I thank you for the heart of this people. And I ask, Lord, that uh, you just make them, make me, make us a people who sees, a people who will take the time, a people who will have your compassion, a people who won't be put off by people's rudeness or coldness or filth or condition, but we'll see your image in people wherever they are, day to day, on Sundays and Monday through Saturday. And I pray, Lord, for anybody who's sitting here this morning who just feels unseen. And I ask today, Jesus, just for your revelation to them that you do see. Lord, anybody who feels separate from you this morning because of shame, because of past things, because of any brokenness or failure, I ask today, Jesus, that they just know 
that you didn't put them in a box. That that's not how you define them. You do not define us by our weakness and failure. You define us by your love, by your care. So I ask for that revelation for every heart today. Just come, Holy Spirit. How about I ask that you would release such a grace and a love, healing on this congregation, Lord, that'll just spread door to door throughout this community in the Central Coast. Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you. Thank you. Hey, why don't you stand up here for just a moment? I think you brought a good word for for um, our family and for every person, all these people, you know, and uh, we just have to acknowledge in this moment that a word came forth today and Jesus says a word is like a seed so a word is not just like a good uh, teaching or series of uh, sentences that we hear and like like and then move on but it's more like a seed that has to go in and then take root and grow and um, so you know Jeff did his part you did your part Jeff you, you sought the Lord and you delivered and you, you know, you served us really well today. I appreciate this, Jeff, very much. Um, and now, and now we have our part, which is guarding the seed. So God spoke us a word into our hearts today, and that seed now gets an opportunity to grow, and it can grow tenfold, thirtyfold, hundredfold, depending on like how rich the soil is and how we guard the word. So I just, I'm even mindful this morning that um, sometimes we hear the word and we're excited, like that was great, I like that, that was awesome. And then we go home and uh, it, it's like the, the soil was kind of rocky. It wasn't as soft as we thought. Sometimes there, it was a little confusing. And we were supposed to go home and think about it more. And it's like the birds come and steal the word. And then sometimes we go home and we start thinking, how am I going to pay my bills? Who am I going to marry? What am I going to watch on TV? <laughs> Et cetera, all the cares of the world. How am I going to replace my tires on my car? Something like that. And it chokes out the word. So like something as precious as God's word this morning uh, it has like some resistance against it. So I, I just want to say that back to us. Let's, let's, let's treasure this word. God wants a church that sees. God wants sons and daughters that see. That see people like Jesus sees people. So I just want you to put your hand on your heart or something. I just think this is representative of the soil. And I just want to pray a prayer. God, I just pray for the soil of our hearts. That it would be rich soil. It would be soft soil. It would be tilled soil. God, that the soil would not be rocky where it looks happy because we received it in the moment but didn't treasure it you know 20 minutes later i want to pray god that the seed wouldn't be choked out by things that we uh mistakenly believe are more important like i don't know paying the bills or figuring life out uh the cares of this world pray god that we wouldn't get choked out you know we pray for the the confusion the enemy wouldn't be able to steal the seed either but this one would go deep this word would go deep there'd be people marked today by seeing people as Jesus sees people. Uh, there'd be a, a church marked for generations that sees people the way Jesus sees people. God, that this would produce such a powerful crop in our life that nothing could come against them. We just pray that this, this seed would be such a good crop that one day many seeds would come from it too at full fruition. That the message Jeff gave that many of us would give this message to people someday in our own words, in our own experience, in our own revelation. That even though maybe maybe 60 of us heard this today, that hundreds would hear this word today through our lives, through our words, through our children, through our grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Okay, I wanted to say something else. You can take your hand off your heart. Amen. Um, so I always like to tell you this. It's, it's really free to go to church here. And God, God provides for this church. And God provides for Jeff. And, and Jeff knows that. He didn't come because he, he needed provision. But, and God's going to provide for Jeff. But if giving is kind of new to you, it's, it's cooler when you get to be part of God's provision for someone else. And Jeff, Jeff, we want Jeff to keep giving his word to people and keep sharing the, the, uh, 
the ministry of Jesus with people. So if that, you know, makes your heart excited, I want to challenge you or encourage you to give, uh, give a gift today. Uh, what, how, whatever that looks like for you, that's between you and Jesus. And no one's going to come <laughs> help you with that. That's between you and God. But I just want to encourage you, don't miss out. It's going to be fun. Um, God's going to keep working through Jeff. And it's a privilege that we get to, to be with him today and last week. And his wife, Sydney, thanks for being here. Um, but yeah, I just encourage you to, to get in on the fun and, and give a gift. And write a little note if you're going to use the papers or on the website or on check. Write a little note that it's for Jeff Eggers and his ministry. Cool. Well, hey, why don't you all stand? Uh, one more thing. If you, if you are not sure whether you're a Christian yet, you're like, I'm not sure. I kind of hope, maybe think I am. If you're, you're unsure about the like, salvation status of your soul, if you're unsure if you really for 100% sure belong to Jesus, I want, I want to challenge you today to give your, give your life to Jesus. Make the biggest decision of your life. It's bigger than who you'll marry or where you'll live or where you'll work. It's bigger than how you'll pay your bills or anything else. Do you want to surrender your life to Jesus? I want to encourage you to do that today. Where's our ministry team? Raise your hand. Okay, so here's some. Raise a little higher. There you go. Um, they have a, a, a lanyard on. I'd like to encourage you to go find them and, and pray with them. Say, hey, today's my day. I need to give my life to Jesus. And they'll be happy to pray a prayer with you. Okay? Anything else? Should we release? Yeah. Remember the classes after church today? Jeff, do you, do you want to you pray? Or, or, no. You want me to? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, Father, we thank you. We thank you for the word. We thank you for your love. And God, we thank you that you are... You're the great seer. And I just think about, I'm just mindful of that like witchcraft little third eye nonsense and everyone else trying to do counterfeits of seeing these days, the psychic and tarot cards and everyone wanting to see who they really are through palm readings and all this counterfeit stuff that demons speak and, and then it comes with hooks, it comes with nightmares, it comes with anxiety, it comes with terrors, it comes with physical illnesses. Just thank you, Jesus. There's no hooks with you. Your love is the real deal. And your eyes, you are, you are the great seer. You see us all so clearly. So we just um, we celebrate you. We thank you. We treasure you. Thank you that your eye sees us to our depths, to our core, and loves us deeply. And that's unchanging. And we thank you, God, for um, new eyes. We pray, God, today we could take off old glasses where we need to. There's, there's no uh, divide that we need to see. We need to see people the way Jesus sees them. I just pray for fresh eyes. Pray as we go forth that this, this word would go with us this week and we'd see we'd see a change in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. All right. Yeah, I want to give a round of applause. Thanks, Jeff.